Hi y'all. In this video, let's talk a little bit about those molar hearings. I planned on talking about them a little bit earlier, but the, the hearings were so soporific that I was knocked unconscious until moments ago. But here I am to talk about it now. So anyway, um, before the hearings happened, after the report was published and Mueller put out his press conference, I made a video talking about the report on the obstruction bit and uh, that the, the future prospects of a congressional hearing and how Mueller had, in, in subtle and not subtle ways, indicated one that he did not want to testify before the Congress. Uh, that was not subtle. But then in subtle ways he kind of shot some, uh, put some warning shots across the bow of both the re Republicans and Democrats not to call him. They don't, they don't want to go there because it's not going to work out well for whichever party decides to, uh, to you know, drop the hammer on that. Uh, Lindsey Graham, the Republicans, uh, they kind of figured that out. Uh, they decided that uh, we're not going to call him. Nadler, on the other hand, decided that he was going to. And it's, it just reminds me of when I was a kid, my brother and I would fight about various things, and my dad would say something like, uh, you know, if I swear to God, if there were a pile of shit in the front yard, and one of you thought the other one wanted it, you'd fight to the death over it. And that's a lot of what happens in Washington, and it seems like Nadler really wanted to own a pile of shit, and so I guess he could have like dibs on digging through it to look for snacks, or maybe a pearl or a diamond in there. I don't know what he was looking for, but he didn't get what he wanted. Now, I expected, and I, I'd said, and some people had told me that I was full of shit, I didn't know what I was talking about, Mueller was not giving any warning shots, uh, he was inviting the Congress to, to enter, to the Democrats, to call him in so that way he could just really stick it to the Republicans, stick it to, to uh, Trump. I was like, no, nah, that's not going to happen. Uh, it, whichever party's dumb enough to, to summon him is going to pay a heavy price for it. Uh, I did not know how heavy of a price, but I knew it was going to be painful. I figured that at least he'd give whatever party called him something. They'd be clever enough to get something out of him, but holy shit, he gave them nothing. The only thing that even potentially look, looked like he was giving them something was something uh, that Ted Lieu, who is a pathological liar, uh, elicited out of him uh, by a, a leading question. And then uh, yeah, that was the first hearing. At the second hearing that day, Mueller actually, before he testified uh, for the, the, the new bit, made... Uh, made it a point to correct the record, to correct his response to Ted Lieu, that the response was not correct. Uh, I, I guess one of his aides told him what he was actually asked, and he's like, that is not a proper way to state what happened, uh, and I want to correct the, the record on this. Even after he corrected the record, Tim, uh, Ted Lieu is still running around on Twitter and various places saying, ah, he, is, he admitted that, that the OLC opinion is the reason that he didn't, uh, no, uh, so Mueller has had to uh, make a couple of corrections on that very point because he sometimes misstates it. And uh, he's had to issue, I think, two corrections now uh, about just that very issue. But anyway, uh, he gave them nothing but a black eye. Now, before it happened, uh, MSNBC, I talked about, some, talked about this in my last video. I was watching some of the pundits talk about what they expected to be happening. And it struck me as peculiar that not a single one that I saw on any of the left-wing news organization sites had any kind of grasp on the subject. And so there's this one guy who was talking on an MSNBC show, and he was saying just all kinds of stupid shit like, now Fox News is not even covering the Mueller issue, the Mueller, the Mueller hearing stuff, and the the airhead, you know, the you know how they are, they uh, they hire people who you know they have, they're, they're, they've been blonde for this long, so they're only that stupid, who who without a teleprompter just are complete idiots. They don't know what's going on if it's not on their script. Then, ooh, who, who could have told? Who, 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 who could have known anything about this? Unlike on Fox News, where they at least hire people who have degrees in like law and stuff. Uh, some of them, some of them are idiots, but they do hire some smart people at Fox. And uh, anyway, I mean as hosts. But this this one airhead said her only pushback against the claim that Fox News does not even cover the Mueller hearing issue is really. And that was it. So that was the uh, I guess that's MSNBC's version of hard hitting journalism. And he went on to say all kinds of stupid shit including that uh, the Republicans are going to try to come after Mueller, but Mueller knows his report, Mueller wrote his report, and he is going to chapter and verse them like no other. And I'd said at the time that that was just absolutely stupid. For one, the committee he was going to appear, be, be appearing before, or one of the committees before which he'd be appearing, has a lot of lawyers on it. This is the most important issue, uh, the most important hearing they're going to have on the most important political issue of the last several years. I can assure you that the Republican lawyers on that panel are going to have done the research. They're going to know uh, that report backwards and forwards. They'll have committed significant portions of it to memory. 
So that way if Mueller makes a single misstep or if the Democrats make a single misstep, uh, they're going to be like, I'm sorry, if you open your report to page whatever in volume two and check here on footnote six, you said this. And uh, that is exactly what happened. Every time there was just the slightest deviation, Republicans pounced. And the, the big takeaway from it is that uh, Mueller did exactly the same thing that James Comey did that the Inspector General Horowitz chastised Comey for having done. And that is ad hoc interpretation of rules rather than following departmental policies. Uh, following the statute or the regulations promulgated pursuant to the statute and the long-standing uh, were the effective policies, and by effective I mean the, the ones in force, policies of the DOJ and uh, the FBI for, for Comey, but the special counsel for Mueller. And it was, uh, it was, this was brought home in the first few minutes of Republican questioning about uh, what the statutory obligation of the special counsel is, the scope of the office, the responsibilities of the office, and that they have to apply and it goes through you know, the whole list of what, what's covered in the Code of Federal Regulations, which is a regulation that is promulgated by the executive, but is uh, incorporated by statute and has the force of law because it's authorized by a statute. So in any event, that you shall comply with the, the United States Attorney's Manual, you shall comply with departmental policies, and goes through all these requirements, and then you just walk them through. Why did you make this decision? Why did you make that decision? What departmental policy can you refer to where any prosecutor under any circumstances conducts investigations with respect to exonerations. Your job is to make a decision about whether charges should or should not be filed and whether or not to take them to a grand jury or to just close the case. At no nowhere do you exonerate anyone under any circumstances. And the response Mueller gave to that entire line of questioning is the same thing that Comey uh, gave in response to why did you make this decision in defiance of this policy? And he says, well, this was a special case, and it needed special, special, essentially, it needed to have a special rule, which I just made up for myself as I went on. And as I.G. Horowitz mentioned when he was testifying about the uh, Comey, among other things, that it is a false choice. The obligation is to just follow the policies. And if you don't like them, then you can resign, or you can assign the case to someone else. But it is not your prerogative to simply say, I think this case is special, therefore, I'm going to engage in ad hoc reasoning because there's another name in the law for ad hoc reasoning, and that is a den denial of due process. That is biased uh, investigations. That is putting your finger on the scales of justice to reach preordained or uh, outcomes that one side or other might, might want you to reach. That is putting a political bent or some kind of bent that is improper for an investigator on the investigation. Your obligation is to apply the policies to the facts that you have and not to deviate from the policies because you think that the person is a special person. This is to say that there is some person who is either above or below the law, and that is simply not a valid option. It is a false choice. It is improper, and that's why if Comey had still been in his job, he would have been sent uh, for you know, recommendation for termination uh, for violating those policies or for discipline for violating those policies because it's not a proper uh, activity for an investigator in the Department of Justice. And I'll say anywhere else. You have the reason that you have policies is they you follow them whether you like them or not because they apply to everyone and if you think the policy is bad there are ways to recommend changing it that don't include saying I'm just going to ignore it make up my own replace the rules overrule the statute and the long-standing interpretations of the statutes and do my own thing in pursuit you know, I'm going to do capital G good in the universe uh, and uh, the obligation was to reach a decision about whether or not the facts are sufficient to support a, a, uh, you know, a charge for this crime or that crime, or whether they are insufficient to support a charge for this crime or that crime, just like you did with, the, with Volume 1. You had no problems following the rules there. You knew that your job was to, with respect to each person in there, to reach a decision about whether or not you think the facts, that the evidence that you have collected, when taken together and applying the applicable law, are adequate to state a charge or not. And if they are, you make that recommendation, and if they aren't, the case dies. In this case, because it, even because he could not pro, uh, even because he could not indict a sitting president, uh, that, still does not, that does not relieve him of the obligation of the special counsel statute, which is not simply to, to seek indictments. It is to make a recommendation to the Attorney General about whether or not a crime was or was not committed. And then the Attorney General will make the decision after you've submitted the report. Mueller didn't do that. And he, the reason he didn't do that, as he said, 
it's a special case, and I decided, he didn't say it exactly like this, but he says, this is a unique case, and then I decided to do my own thing in violation of the, uh, the regulations that created the office, uh, which I swore on my own oath to uphold. And that, I mean, that right there is when the whole thing just ended. All the rest of the day was just theater. Uh, and it was good theater in certain parts, but none of them had to do with Mueller talking. Um, it was, part of it was he was just reluctant to be there, which is why right out of the gate when he was asked to, by a Democrat to open the report to some various page and uh, to read a paragraph. And he goes, no, the report's submitted. You can read it for yourself if you want to, Congressman. So that's the, I'm just, I'm not cooperating. I'm not going to play your, your silly little game. If you want to read something into the record, to have it on, you know, said before the cameras, knock yourself out. I'm here to answer questions, not to, uh, not to play your little games. And then on the questions, it seems like the, I refer to him as, uh, well, a couple different names. One of them was Sergeant Sundowner, because it, he didn't seem to be too particularly with it at certain points. He was unaware of the name of the president who hired him, you know, kind of the thing. That's sort of the thing that you kind of just don't forget, you know, the name of the president. There's a reason when uh, you're assessing someone uh, for their cognitive awareness, uh, you know, see if they're alert, oriented, and aware of their surroundings, you'll ask them questions for things that people will simply just know. You don't ask them hard questions, so you ask them, you know, what day is it? Where are you? Who is the president? You know, things like that. What country are you in? Things that you just don't forget. People don't forget being hired, being appointed by the United States president to one of the most senior positions in the government unless you're Mueller. Uh, so I'm thinking there's some, I don't know if he was like sick and dehydrated because in the afternoon he was, he was doing better, but in the morning he was just, mm -mm, not not there. Uh, he looked completely bewildered at certain points. He was uh, unaware of what was in his report. The, it's long been speculated that he didn't write the report and that he did not actually write the press release. And this was put to him about who actually wrote the press release. And Mueller says, I'm not going to answer that. And the, the Republican representative says, just as I thought, you're not its author. Someone else is. And uh, that was a recurring, uh, well, that's a theme of the whole thing. It's, it's clear that <clears throat> the name that bears Mueller's report bears it in title only. He is not the author of it. He was not in command of virtually any of the facts. He was. Uh, he contradicted the record constantly, and he would be corrected uh, by the Republicans. They say, well, if you turn here to page, volume one, page 182, paragraph six, it says, that and then Mueller said, "Well, if that's what the report says, and that's what the, that's what it is." And the question is, you've had two and a half, two years to deal with this. Uh, how is it you don't know what is in your your own report? Uh, that that is no bueno. Uh, so after all that was said and done uh, during the day, Lindsey Graham said, "I had decided against calling Mueller to testify, and now America can see why I made that decision. I don't know if that's really the reason he decided not to do it, because Mueller was you know, not operating on all cylinders that day, not firing on all thrusters. Uh, I don't know how well he knows him, how much he sees him, uh, or whatever, but uh, that could have been it. But I think my my best guess is that uh, the warnings, that the subtle indicators from Mueller while he was talking, that it would be unwise to uh, to, to try to use him as your political pawn, uh, was received well by the Republicans, uh, but not by the Democrats. And the Democrats thought that they would break him down. And as I mentioned, he made it clear right from the get-go when, when someone asked him to <clears throat> read from his report. Because I the report's in the record. If you want to read it out loud, Senator uh, Congressman, knock yourself out. I mean, it's like <laughs> one of the uh, Trevor. What's that guy's name on the, the Daily Show that took over from John Stewart? Trevor something. He's like it's like the worst audio book ever. You open it, it says, <laughs> turn to page one and start reading. Ding. You know, that's essentially Mueller. He was just not playing the game. So that cracked me up. But it, it was really sad to see that uh, a guy who is known for uh, being you know, punctilious was just not in command of the facts of the case. He didn't know what was in his report. He would say something when he was correct. He'd go, well, if that's what the report says, then, then that's what I meant, or that's what you should go with. And then it, it, really, do, it really does... It seemed to me that, that the reason that he was saying, you don't want to call me in here, is one, I'm reluctant, and two, I have no idea what this case is about, believe me. Uh, sorry, I'm not going to be able to help you, even if I wanted to, I just, I don't know anything. Uh, and various things that were actually in his mandate, he just declined to do, saying that's not within the scope of my mandate. For example, he was tasked with finding out whether or not there was, uh, obstruct whether or not there was collusion uh, in our, the 2016 presidential election. He was very concerned about a meeting that took place in Trump Tower involving 
some Russians and some Trump campaign people. Uh, but the very same people who met with the Trump people had a meeting before that with the DNC, or the Democrats, I should say, and then immediately after that had uh, the follow-up meeting about the meeting they just had with Trump, with the Democrats. Mueller had no interest at all in the same people going from a, Demo uh, you know, a Democrat office to Trump Tower to talk to Trump, and then back to the Democrat office. The only thing I cared about was, did you talk to any Trump people while you were there? We, ha we, we have no interest at all in whether or not you were working with the DNC in order to do this with, uh, with the Russians, to debate Trump, to trap Trump, or whatever it was. No interest in that at all. You know, it is, as <laughs> I hate to say it, a witch hunt. Because there's no there there, as Peter Strzok said in his texts, or no big there there, and that uh, the investigators uh, had no actual interest in solving the problem. They were only interested in what they could get on Trump. They had no interest at all in anybody else's involvement, and whenever pushed on that, he'd say, oh, that's for other people in the Department of Justice to look at. That's for other uh, stakeholders to, to look into. It's like, so really, what we should do is we should go back and reread the mandate that you received that created your office, appointed you as into it, and uh, tasked you with doing certain things, it, we should just scratch out a whole bunch of words about a possible uh, Russian influence on the 2016 election and replace that with, find out whether or not Donald Trump had any meetings with any Russians in a bad way. That, that should be what it was, because you had multiple sources, multiple leads you could have followed, and you knew about them, and you decided that even though it is the same supposed bad actors meeting with Trump, that was meeting with the DNC before meeting with Trump, or meeting with Trump's people, and then meeting with the, I keep saying DNC, the Democrats, uh, however broadly or narrowly you want to construe that, that the same people who were meeting with the Trump people you're worried about came directly, went directly there from a meeting with Democrats, and then went back to the Democrats. And you're only interested about what happened in the middle of that trip, not at the beginning and not at the end. How interesting. It's almost like a political witch hunt, which uh, in indeed, the uh, the alleged conspiracy theories. Remember uh, during the well after the election, I think it was when uh, when Mike Ro when Admiral Rogers kind of told Trump that Trump was being surveilled by the Obama administration, uh, and then Trump says, "Oh my God, you know they wiretapped me." And the 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 defense of the media was not about surveillance; it was about wiretapping. You know, narrowly construed as to mean actually literally going to a physical wire. And, and cutting you know the, the, the board around it, you know, stripping it off, and then uh, tapping into it. A, a, a literal wiretap. Not you know, plugging in some other way, not electronic uh, intervent, you know, not, not a cellular intervention, not uh, some kind of computer access in a nefarious way, not planting a bug, not, uh, not using microphones to sit outside of the eaves, you know, eavesdropping, which is different than wiretapping because you can wiretap where wires are, but you can eavesdrop under the eaves, you know. No, it, it, they were, oh no, he said wiretapping. And that's the only possible thing that a person could mean by wiretapping is, is the 1920s technology of cutting into the wire. That, that's what it means. It's like, no, you fucking retards. It is, he, what he's saying is, it is, is synecdoche. It is to talk about the general by pointing to the, the particular. When a person wants to talk about the movie industry, they just say, Hollywood. Hollywood is not the movie industry. It is one subset of the movie industry, which is much, much larger than Hollywood. But everybody understands when you talk about Hollywood, uh, you're talking about one of two things. Literally just Hollywood geographically or the movie industry. And when, you're, and when you're not talking about geography, it's kind of obvious you're talking about movie makers, actors, directors, producers, you know, that whole kind, that whole, uh, the whole shebang. Similarly, when people talk about being wiretapped or bugged, uh, they don't mean literally that a person has broken into my house uh, and the only thing I could possibly mean by it is that someone has literally broken into my home and placed a small recording device somewhere surreptitiously in my house. If you say you've been bugged, I think most people understand what you're talking about is that your conversations have been monitored and recorded. What you're saying is not a secret. It is not confined to the four walls. By some method, some means, uh, the, that is being tracked. It, it's just, it's just the, the willful uh, stupidity of, of the media. They, they, and Coulter, and I, when I said this, when I realized this the first time, I realized, I thought, oh my god, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I said it. The, the first person who I saw publicly who got Trump was Ann Coulter. She was the first person to speak intelligently about him that I saw, and she said, look, the media has a problem. They insist on taking Trump literally, word perfect literally, 
but they refuse to take him seriously. And that's why he's going to he's going to beat them. And he did. So, you know, that was with wiretapping. And then every other thing that he has said about, let me rephrase that, many of the things that he said are stupid. Uh, but some of the things, some of the more seemingly outrageous things that people, the Democrats don't want to believe, and even some Republicans don't want to believe, that people are saying, oh, it's a conspiracy theory, have worked out to be true. To include the it, bit with the, uh, the applications for the FISA warrants and their uh, invalidity. The reason that uh, Comey was disclosing to Trump certain things, and then when Trump asked him to say it publicly, one, there's records that show that Trump, that Comey actually did say he would try to find a way to publicly state that Trump was not under investigation, and there's now reason to believe that that was actually a lie, that there was not a formal investigation opened up by any normal procedure, but uh, Comey was trying to trick the president into doing something so that way he could open up, uh, you know, he could bring him down. And that's going to be coming out, uh, I'm told, in the Horowitz report before too much longer, by September, I think, we'll see. And a whole bunch of things that it, it really was a cabal of retarded folks in the government who thought that they knew better than the American people and that their job was to stop Americans from having what it was that Americans had elected through the ordinary process. That they wanted to find some way to uh, kneecap this president uh, and, and take him out. And, um, well, we see how that worked out. Uh, most of those people are now out of the government. Uh, some of them are potentially facing charges. So we shall see how that works out. That's what I have to say about the Mueller hearing and the whole two-year saga of uh, trumped-up bullshit. There was no Russian conspiracy. Uh, there was no obstruction of justice. And the American people now, uh, by better than two to one odds since Mueller uh, testified, uh, have no time for impeachment. So the Democrats uh, did only one thing. They solidified their own incompetence by calling Mueller. They proved that, that they're just too stupid for that kind of thing, and the impeachment issue is now dead. Uh, I'm sure some people keep talking about it, but it is no longer a live possibility. Uh, have a great day.